We would very much like to welcome our, our very distinguished guests here tonight. Um, first of all, we have uh, the Right Honourable Ben Bradshaw, Member of Parliament, and Dr. James Forder. Um, they will both be arguing their respective uh, sides of the debate, and we expect it to be uh, very, very interesting. Now, for those of you who don't know how the format works at these uh, Think Tank Society events, um, these seminars work as a means of being able to identify different parts of the issue, and hopefully for us to be inspired to go away and write articles for our journal. And now our journal, the deadline for submissions is the 20th of April, and we hope that uh, all of you will be inspired to go away and write, it's not necessary, but we do have a number of uh, work placement opportunities at the Institute for Public Policy Research, and if you would like to uh, get involved with these work placement opportunities, then you will need to write an article. So all of the details about the work placements and about how to write an article will be on our website. Um, as I said, this is the last event of this year, so please do join the mailing list because next year we're going to be uh, even bigger and even better. So if you would like to get involved uh, in the committee, we're gonna be expanding, so please check over the summer all of your emails and keep posted with uh, what's going to be happening with the society. So without further ado, I would very much like to welcome our guests and hand over to Josh who is going to be running the event for this evening. Thank you very much. Um, again, I'd like to say, on behalf of yeah. the Think Tank Society, uh, thank you all for coming. Um, my name is Joshua Tierney, and I'm Vice President for the Internal Policy Centre. Uh, I'm very proud to be able to welcome both speakers, Oxford academic and author of the book, The Case Against Voting Reform, uh. Dr. James Forder, who will be speaking against the proposed change and Ben Bradshaw, former cabinet minister and current MP for Exeter, as well as leader of the Labour campaign for Yes to AB, who will be arguing for the proposed changes. Today we will be discussing the proposed change to the electoral system. Um, now obviously the system we use in the country at the moment is first past the post um, to elect the House of, Lo House of Commons. Sorry. Um, and it's been criticised most notably by the Liberal Democrat Party. Um, as giving parties a disproportionate share of seats in the House of Commons, um, as well as uh, allowing parties to take seats without an overall majority uh, and having safe seats in those areas. Um, in 1997, Labour won 63.6% seats compared to their 43.2% uh, of popular vote. Um, so you can see where the criticism is coming from. The alternative vote system. Um, is a system that sees uh, voters rank candidates in order of preference um, in si single constituencies. People can nominate uh, as many candidates as they like um, and, and rank them as they wish. Um, but in the first round, only your first preference counts. And if, if in that round, if 50%, if one candidate gets 50% of the votes, then and they are automatically elected. However, if they do not, then um, the candidate with the lowest percentage is um, excluded and uh, their second choices are redistributed among the remaining candidates. Um, again, if they receive 50% of the vote, the, if a single candidate receives 50% of the vote, then they will be elected uh, as the MP. If there is no uh, overall majority, um, then the system continues until we do find someone with a 50% majority. Um, this might be slightly easier to understand with an example. Now, say there was a referendum for the new capital of Great Britain using the AB, and voters were asked to choose between either London, Glasgow, Newcastle, or Manchester. Um, now, say in the first round of voting, 39% of the population voted for London, 29 for Glasgow, Manchester got 19, and Newcastle got 13%. Now, London has the largest share, but no overall majority. So Newcastle is um, Newcastle's votes are redistributed, um, and London now has 42%, Glasgow 35%, Manchester 23%. Um, still, there's no overall majority, but as you can see, London is still in the lead. Um, Manchester has the least number of votes, and Glasgow has increased dramatically um, thanks to the new Newcastle's support, effectively. Um, now, Manchester is um, removed, and their second 
or third preferences if their second preferences were Newcastle are distributed to either London or Glasgow and uh, say now London has 46% and Glasgow has 54%. Um, Glasgow has the overall majority and is elected as the Newcastle city for London. Um, even though London uh, initially had the largest number of votes, you can see that um, the votes from Newcastle and Manchester, Newcastle and Manchester, have allowed Glasgow to beat London. Um, this is obviously a hypothetical situation, but it does highlight how, with this system, one choice can overtake another um, in various rounds of vote allocation. Um, and if one choice is disliked by a significant proportion of the electorate, then it's unlikely to win. Um, so where is A the use? Where else um, can we see it in action? Well, it's actually already used in this country. Um, it's used for the mayor of Lu to, um, to vote for the mayor of London, and it is also used by the Labour Party and the Liberal Democrats to choose their leader. Um, internationally, it's used in Australia to let that elect their House of Representatives and Papua New Guinea for, and for the election of the Fijian House of Representatives. That concludes my introduction. Um, I now hand it over to ben, ben Bradshaw, who will argue why we should change the voting system, um, and then uh, to Dr. James Border, who will argue um, why we shouldn't change. Thank you. Um, thank you, Josh. I, mean, I, I think the, the choice that you face this evening is the same choice that you'll face on May the 5th, and it's not a choice between first past the post and your ideal voting system, it's a choice between first past the post and AV. Now I don't think there is a, 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 a perfect voting system anywhere in the world, uh, but it's my very strong view that first past the post has to be the least perfect, and let me just explain why I believe that's the case. What first past the post does, and you saw this in the last election in the UK in 2010, where that result was determined by the votes of just 1.6% of the electorate in a small number of swing seats, the seats that change hands and therefore determine the outcome of the election. The consequence of that is that the political parties focus their resources, their time, their energy on that small number of swing seats, and they focus their policies as well on that small number of swing seats voters. So if you live in a rock-solid Labour seat or a rock-solid Tory seat or one of the few rock-solid Liberal Democrat seats, uh, you get very little attention from the political parties. Very little activity goes on in your constituency. And if you live in one of those rock-solid safe seats and never vote for the winning candidate, your vote, in effect, never counts for anything. And that, that you are in the majority if you're one of those uh, people. What first, to pass, first Past the Post has also created is it's created something called the safe seat syndrome. The fact that around two-thirds of existing constituencies in the UK never change hands. Uh, if you look back to the expenses scandal of two years ago, there was a very clear correlation between MPs who sat in safe seats, who were safe for life, if you like, and the level of their expenses uh, claims. So not only is first past the post very disproportional, uh, it excludes people who live in safe seats from their votes counting, it encourages tactical voting. Uh, if you're a Labour supporter in my part of the world, in, in rural Devon, uh, you're very tempted often to vote Liberal Democrat to stop the Conservatives. Similarly, if you're a Tory supporter in Inner Glasgow and you think the Scottish National Party has a better chance of beating Labour, you vote Scottish National rather than uh, for your heart voting Tory. Now, one of the advantages of AV is that it re releases you from that pressure to vote tactically. You can vote with your heart for your first choice, and you can vote with your head for your second choice. Because it also requires the winning candidate to get beyond the 50% support from either first or second preferences, it also, I believe, gives that MP or candidate a greater level of legitimacy. Every MP who is elected can say that they have been elected on the first or second preferences of at least 50% of their voters. It reduces the safe seat syndrome because it makes it much easier for the voter to throw out a lazy, incompetent or corrupt member of parliament. And it also makes it much less likely uh, that the 
the members of the party concerned are going to select or tolerate a lazy, incompetent or corrupt uh, member of parliament representing them. And there's one last point I want to make in AB's favour, and that is because individual candidates or MPs uh, will have to reach out beyond their core voters, I think it will lead to a more pluralistic and a more interesting uh, politics. At the moment, uh, you can be elected under first past the post with as little as 28% of the vote in any one constituency. And in many safe seats, individual candidates, if they work very hard at all, simply uh, project their message to their own core voters in the safe knowledge that they'll always be re-elected. Because AV reduces the safe seat syndrome and requires you to, be, to win second preferences or to aim to win second preferences as well as first preferences, I think that will lead to candidates being more interesting, uh, more original, uh, and more pluralistic in their political appeal. Uh, I mean, it's no accident, for example, that uh, civic society organisations like Operation Black Vote and other organisations that represent underrepresented uh, people in our democracy are supporting a switch to AV. So I think I'll leave my initial comments there, but I look, out, look forward to teasing out some of these uh, ideas in the discussion that we'll be having in a moment's time. Thank you. Well, thank you all for coming. I, I uh, became interested in this <coughs> issue only when the referendum was called. Normally, I'm an economist, um, not even a political scientist, but I was listening to the arguments being made over a long period, which were, of course, arguments about proportional representation, not arguments about AB. And it struck me that those arguments weren't making contact with uh, what I observed about the realities of politics. And so there's an issue here about being realistic about what actually goes on in a political system as distinct from uh, dreaming about some utopian conception of democracy. And this I you know, hope to interest you in my book, but it was because of this uh, view of the debate that I wanted to write that book and explain it. Now, it's a bit of an oddity that the debate, having gone on since the 1970s, intensely since the 1970s and somewhat before, we're now having a referendum on something different because it's been a debate about proportional representation for which I can see a principled case. I think it's a mistaken case, but I can see what it is. And I'm quite sure that Ben can as well. Um, because, of course, um, the, a the alternative vote has come up um, as a sort of messy compromise. And lots of people, didn't they, always said that they were opposed to it when the issue used to be raised. Once upon a time, you were opposed Not to it. Not compared to first past the post, though. No. Not compared to the first past the post, but actually not supporting AV. In the case of this huge numbers of people opposed to AV, one of the reasons, if I'm not mistaken, is precisely this point about disproportionality. Uh, Josh reminded us that Tony Blair won 63% of seats on 42% of the vote um, in 1997. And of course, the estimates say, insofar as the researchers can work that, he'd have won many more seats with AV because that was a year where there was a very substantial anti-Tory majority. So there were going to be plenty of Liberal Democrats voting Labour. So if disproportionality is what concerns you about first past the post, be warned, AB can be worse. Let me um, talk about, I counted four arguments that, four other, well, four arguments Ben made, disproportional came in as one of them. Ignoring voters. It seems to me that that's precisely what doesn't happen. Yes, it may be true that extra um, cabinet members turn up in marginal constituencies and all that kind of thing. What strikes me is that the effective campaign in general elections is a national campaign. It works very well as such. You might think it was better if cabinet members came and knocked on your door personally, but that's just dreaming. It's not going to happen. You watch the party political broadcast and you find out what's happening. It's nothing to do with parties only campaigning in marginal seats. Uh, safe seat syndrome. Uh, the expenses scandal was apparently connected with people who had seats for life. Well, that's interesting, because uh, not after the expenses scandal they didn't. 
Uh, what I noticed about that was, again, the system working very well, and dozens of MPs lost their jobs because their parties couldn't stand them.